trying to somehow restore order. This is a disgrace. Welcome to the broadcast, Steve Berthume. Steve Levy along the way. It wasn't a brawl in Detroit Friday night. It was a full-scale riot and one of the ugliest incidents of player fan violence that we've ever seen in this country. The palace was anything but. What you are about to see will be talked about for years to come. And before you unconditionally blame the players, take a look and a listen. Played a very intelligent game tonight. Then Wallace is fouled, and Wallace did... Oh, oh Wallace! Right on our chest! This has potential to be serious if they don't get between. Wallace upset. Players trying to hold each other off. Steven Jackson and Rasheed Wallace trying to be peacemakers. Now Jackson yelling. Wallace still going. You need the coaches in there to get him away. Jackson challenging Derek Coleman. Somebody should just get Jackson out of there. That's what causes the problem. Rasheed Wallace did an excellent job trying to keep everybody away and trying to keep the peace. But it started after our chest with a hard foul on Wallace after he got behind him. And then Ben Wallace came over with the shove. And an ugly way for this one to wind down. Totally uncalled for. I want to see the foul again because it appeared Wallace was past him and our chest shoved him. And that's what Wallace took exception to, but you still can't react that way. You've got to let it go. That's not that hard of a foul. It's not a normal foul, but not that hard. And, and Ben Wallace can't react that way. Wallace is still charged up. Now, Wallace, I would assume, has been ejected. The way Steven Jackson's carrying on, they should eject him as well. They need to somehow find a way to get this game over with as quickly as possible. The problem is, if Wallace is ejected, I'm not sure, he'd have to walk past the pace of bench to go. Now Artest has jumped over the scorer's table and is trying to get down to the bench. Artest is in the stands. Oh, this is awful. Fans are getting involved. Steven Jackson's in the fans. Rasheed Wallace going into the stands. The security trying to somehow restore order. Fans and players are going at it, and the players trying to help each other out. This is a disgrace. All the players now, they're jumping in there to try and get the other players out because the fans have come involved. Oh, what a sad scene here at the Palace. And now another fight's breaking out in front of the Pistons bench. It's a, it's a fan on the court. This is very, very dangerous. Fans are throwing cups with liquid in them now onto the court. Ron Artest has a look in his eye that's very scary right now. You wonder if the official's going to let this game continue. Now they're throwing bottles out onto the floor. They're trying to get the Pacers to go back to the locker room. What was maybe you could call a hard foul at best has turned into a just a, an ugly, ugly scene. Chuck Person. The officials, I think they're going to call this game off, and that should be. The, the outcome is definitely decided. You have these ridiculous fans trying to go at the players and now throwing. Somebody could really get hurt. This is a bad showing from the Pistons fans here. Just firing bottles from the stands. The Pacers have all gone back in toward the locker room. And they're getting thrown a lot of debris. And they're still not all the way through. And for some reason, one of the Pacers, they hold Austin Crozier out. They want him to get under the tunnel because they're afraid for his safety. They're pouring liquid over. What a disgraceful showing from the Pistons fans here. That's one of the worst scenes I've ever seen. It's an NBA NBA. old moment in NBA history. The players just have to get out of there. Get back to the locker room and forget about it.
The game has been called. The official announcement has been made. The game has been called, which was the right call. The outcome, obviously, is over. And players and fans in danger with the emotions and the tempers being completely lost. More from Mike Breen and Bill Walton shortly. Both teams eventually would head back to the locker room. We're going to go back through the entire situation from start to finish and slow things down for you. Here's how it happened. 45.9 seconds left. Ron Artest, the hard foul on Ben Wallace. It was hard, but it wasn't flagrant. You could make the argument that Wallace overreacted, but that led to pushing and shoving. It seemed like cooler heads were starting to prevail. Now watch Ben Wallace throws a towel at Artest. Artest always in the middle of everything, right? But at this point, our test is actually just chilling. He's lying on the scorer's table. When a fan throws a cup, it hits him in the face. That leads our test into the crowd. He wrestles the fan down to the ground, and I wonder if I should be using the word fan in this particular case. Steven Jackson punches a fan in the face there. Watch the fan come into your picture on the left. He's in a baseball hat right there. He's hitting our test from behind. Watch another fan. He clocks Fred Jones from behind. So the fans are not backing off. They're clearly making matters worse. Then as Artest gets back on the court, watch this. Artest punches that fan right in the face. Looked like the fan was heading towards him. Artest hit him. Then as another fan gets up, watch Jermaine O'Neal, right of your screen coming into the picture right there sends the fan down the officials were banged up in this game as well lower right hand corner of your screen that's Tommy Nunez Jr. he would take a bottle a plastic bottle where you would think off the face now our test is still on the court the cop threatens to spray him with pepper spray but in the end doesn't now, Reggie Miller would come over along with Austin Crozier as Reggie on the right and the cops help get our test off the floor now as Jermaine O'Neal heads off the floor watch this looks like an article of clothing comes flying in his direction almost at Jonathan Bender now by this point our test is off the court heading for the dressing room that's our test there Steven Jackson follows him Meanwhile, the scariest part, watch the upper right-hand corner of your screen now. Here's a chair thrown in, flying in the direction of Jermaine O'Neal. Another fight breaks out. Players, fans, security. Now, to take a good look now, down on the floor in a prone position, you'd be able to get a glimpse right there of what appears to be an older woman lying down in the middle of it all. O'Neal gets hit in the face with what appeared to be a bucket of popcorn. Now watch Jamal Tinsley now. He comes back out of the dressing room, grabs what a dustpan, and is inches away from throwing, hitting somebody. Thought better. The pace was just littered with food and drink as they would exit. People were left bloodied. Fans were left stunned. And kids were left with tears on an overall sorry night for the NBA and especially fans of the Detroit Pistons. These two teams will next meet again in Detroit on March the 25th. Listen to this. Quentin Richardson of the Suns was watching on television. He said, quote, man, there are going to be some lawsuits. You don't think some of those fans aren't going to want some NBA money? Players from both teams left the arena without making any comments. However, the two head coaches both spoke their minds just never seen anything like that I you know I I didn't know what to do myself personally I try to control the players but I've never seen it go in a situation like that maybe maybe I have seen a hockey game once you know but hey I, I you know I love fans to be involved and cheer but to, to throw things and you know, that's, that's, that's not what our fans are like. And then for players to act like that, to, to understand that, that's, that's something I think we're all taught. 
You know, between the lines, a lot of things happen. But there's, there's no place now for, for anybody. I saw the Indiana coaches making an unbelievable effort to, to help. Um, I'm glad our team walked, because I was worried about Steven Jackson and Artest, as silly as, as they were acting. And, you know, I saw some people take punches at them as well. And I told our team, you know, we, we all had a, should, should have gone in the stands to try to help and protect each other. But I don't know what you're going to do in a situation like that. Um, I'm just embarrassed for our league, and I'm disappointed in, you know, being part of this. And there's going to be a lot of thing, ramifications in this, because I've never seen this before. I swear I have. Maybe in the ABA, we used to have that every day. <laughs> no. You know, but uh, not here. I, you know, I've been here one year as a coach. Um, I've been here many times as a visiting coach. And I've never felt our people were ever disrespectful. Um, and it's a shame that a couple, you know, ruin it for so many. Well, I've been around 20 years, and I've never seen or been involved in anything quite like this. Um, you know, I'm proud of the way our guys played. I thought we played a, a really determined, courageous game, and it's, it's unfortunate that it ended the way it did. Our guys. Tried to show a lot of restraint, and then uh, you know th there were things being thrown at them. There were people that were coming in, on out, and, and I understand were attacking our players from the stand. So there there were a lot of things going on. I felt like I was fighting for my life out there, but uh, you know, I'm sorry the game had to end this way. It was a, it was a great game up to that point. The situation was largely over, and I think Ron was laying on the table, which unfortunately gives him easy access to roll over. You know, when the fans get emotional and everything like that. I don't want to assess blame. All I can tell you is that when you go into the crowd, when anybody goes into the crowd, nothing good can happen because you're suddenly surrounded by a sea of fans, some who want to just stop you and control you, some of whom want to hit you. And all of a sudden, you know you're surrounded by the enemy and you just start swinging because you can't tell which is which. And that's why there's very strict rules against that. And uh, you want your fans to be emotional. You just want them to draw a line as well. NBA spokesperson Tim Frank said the league is withholding comment until it can review the incident. Pistons spokesperson Matt Dobek said the police investigation is ongoing and that's it, refusing further comment. We'll show you how that investigation is ongoing shortly. We get more now from our guys who broadcast the game and we're in the middle of it all. Mike Breen and Bill Walton. Certainly one of the most ugliest incidents in NBA history, but also for those here at the Palace, a very scary incident. And the reason being because it went on so long and so many fans were involved in what looked like certainly not enough security. So many players in the stands. There were certain instances that really made you nervous. And one of them, at one point, a chair came flying in where there was a group of players who were together fighting with some of the fans. Some of the players in there fighting with the fans, some of them trying to bring the other players out. You see the chair come flying in hitting several people obviously such a dangerous situation that made it very dangerous and made it very scary then even after Ron Artest was finally dragged out of the stands he's on the court more fans able to get on the court you see Artest fighting with several fans there Jermaine O'Neal later came over and fought with those fans and it became an instance where fans were able to walk wherever they wanted to because security was so worried about certain situations. That's what made it an extremely scary situation because it went on so long and fans were able to get wherever they wanted. Mike, it was frightful here in the palace, and that's not what NBA basketball is about. This is a, a situation that totally broke down. There was chaos everywhere, and the way it kept exploding in different areas, and so while the security were trying their best to break it up, and there were people in there who were trying to be peacemakers, but there was also a lot of uncalled for action out there. This was a total disgrace by everyone involved. No winners whatsoever under any circumstances here. I am devastated. This is the lowest point for me in 30 years with the NBA. And what you said, Bill, about the confusion between who was breaking it up and who was continuing the fight, and that's what made it difficult for security. That's what made it difficult for members of each of the team. Pistons and Pacers at one point were helping each other out in there against the fans, not necessarily fighting the fans. Certainly some of them were, but a lot of them trying to get the players off of the stands area and bring them out on the court and get them out of harm's way. Obviously, it didn't work all that well but uh, a very difficult situation that's going to bring in a lot of ramifications both in penalties, fines, 
and probably stricter security measures at arenas throughout the NBA. Well, Michael, the story gets even a little wilder from there. Following the game, the Auburn Hills deputy police chief reviewed the incident for evidence in ESPN's satellite truck. Now, weighing in our shoot-around crew, led by John Saunders in Times Square. Over the course of our time covering sports and playing sports, we all have agreed that this is clearly the worst thing we have ever seen. It's one of those things that almost sounds like it's an out-of-body experience that you didn't really believe what you were watching. You had a chance to talk to Joe Dumars and have his reaction. Yes, I did. As you know, earlier I spoke to Rick Carlisle. Now I spoke to Joe Dumars. He said it was a totally unacceptable situation. He's embarrassed and ashamed that, that it happened. But he also made it a point, interestingly enough, where he feels that everybody was accountable, not just his players, not just the fans in the city of Detroit, but the Indian Indiana Pacers as well. He felt everybody was involved. Nobody should be absolved from this situation whatsoever. And it's interesting because Rick Carlisle was saying he felt there was some provocation on the part of the Pistons. And now you're hearing Joe Dumas feels just as strongly on the side of the Pistons players. Players. Players, that is. I emphasize. That. I don't agree with that, you know, based, <laughs> based on what I saw. And, and just speaking as an individual, and we talked about it before, if you're walking in Times Square, somebody throws a beer on you, what are you going to do? It's assault, clearly. I don't blame the players for going in this. Well, you got to think about how high the players' emotions are raised at that point anyway. Ron Artest just caught, you know, a blow to the face by Ben Wiles. He's emotionally charged up from that. It's a heated rivalry these two teams have in the first place. Very physical game. Pistons are frustrated. Now Ron Artest trying to remove himself from the situation. Fan cross the line. You get hit with an object. You get physically touched by any type of fan. A player is going to react emotionally. That's how Ron Artest reacted. And obviously then the Indiana Pacers teammates look at like, this guy is one of our teammates. He's one of our brothers. We are going to go up there and we're going to protect him because you don't feel safe in that situation before anymore. Greg, before Greg speaks, I think clarity needs to be made. Joe Dumas wasn't talking about provocation on the part of the Pacers in terms of those players going into, fan, into the stands, from my understanding. He's talking about stuff that was going on during the game, just the same way Rick Carlisle was talking about stuff going on in the game that ultimately led to this. A, a lot of that from both, because if you think about it, each coach has both basically come to the defense of their player, placed in blame elsewhere, and Joe Dumas is doing the same. That's because they understand the ramifications are going to be suspensions and ultimately it's going to have an impact on games won and lost as the season progresses. Now getting back to the incident itself there is blame and there's plenty of blame to go around for everyone but again you got to look at the bigger picture here from the league standpoint what are you going to do to try and protect not only your players but the game itself from having these types of incidents uh, occur out on the basketball floor. You got to do something, put in some type of recourse that will not allow these fans to have access. Because again, you had alcohol involved there. And then when you start drinking, I think that escalates the entire uh, scenario. Again, just a, it's just a black eye. It's embarrassing for everybody involved. It's horrible. And one of the, one of the haunting images of this entire thing is so, you know, frightened children sitting courtside, scared to death, that could be so traumatized by this, they might not want to go back to another sporting event of this magnitude. You know, as we watch that, that is the one thing that stands out in my mind because we can talk about the fans and how reprehensible they were for throwing beer. We can talk about the players and say they shouldn't have gone into the stands. But that arena was filled with children witnessing this kids who just wanted to come and watch a basketball game an nba game and look at their heroes and they were subjected to that absolutely ridiculous right now let's continue with sports center and more ahead from the most stunning nba game we've seen in quite some time more from the shoot around crew in new york and what's next for the players the fans and the league <laughs> Hard fact. Other beers are shipped warm in trucks. Coors Light is always shipped cold. Why? Because we know you love cold beer. Coors Light, our goal, the coldest tasting beer in the world. Inside that digital camera is something familiar, a battery. And while you might think all batteries are the same, consider what happened here last winter when a heart stopped and his life depended on a Zoll defibrillator. 
And when Zold chooses a battery, they trust Duracell. So whether it's saving a moment or saving a life, it just has to work. Duracell, trusted everywhere. At the Palace at Auburn Hills Friday night, an altercation between the Pistons' Ben Wallace and the Pacers' Ron Artest spilled into the stands, creating an ugly riot between players and fans and forcing officials to end the game early. It's been a long time since we've seen something like this. Here's the NBA shoot-around cast with more from New York. Steve, there are various levels of punishment we have to talk about now. Back in 1995, and I'm not trying to compare the two incidents, but I can tell you I was there in Detroit and got hit in the chest by a beer from a fan when the Red Wings lost the game. The police came to me and asked me to go and press charges against that fan. That's one level of punishment that we're going to see, Stephen. Absolutely, and we don't know what else we're going to see. But I spoke to Joe Dumas again, and his position is very, very simple. Nobody is absolved from this situation. At the same time, however, he's saying that if you are a professional player, it is your profession. You have to be above the fans. It's idiotic and as stupid and as cowardly and as despicable as some of them may have been. You have to be above the fray because it is your profession. I'm not sure if anybody up here agrees no, with that, but that is clearly the position. Because the bottom is. line is, again, you are supposed to be professional as long as they are just having or saying things about you, your family, your teammates, or what have you. But it changes when you're provoked physically, and that's what you had happen in tonight's game. That You cannot absolve that because whether or not you want to blame players, they didn't initiate it with the fans. That's the bottom line, and alcohol had a lot to play with it. You expect Joe Dumars to come to the defense of his team and his organization, but the reality is everybody's to blame, fans in particular. Uh, Joe Dumars is coming at it now from the perspective as an executive, and I have the utmost respect for Joe Dumars as a player, as a professional. He's great for the league, but he's completely ridiculous on this point. From this standpoint, there is not a player, I don't think, in the league that would have reacted any differently to Ron Artest, especially under the circumstances when you're emotionally heated after getting into an altercation, and now you get hit in the face with a cup of beer sitting courtside. Any player in the league would react the same way. So it's easy to say players can't do it, players, all of us well, would react that well, way. Well, y'all know, I just finished speaking to a couple of players, one of them being Shaq, and they said they would have done the exact same thing. But understand this before we say this about Joe Dumas. Joe Dumas is the kind of person, he ain't saying it just because he's the president of the Pistons franchise. He's saying it because that's exactly how he feels, because that's the kind of man he is. We just disagree with him. Okay, the, the bigger question, at least as far as the NBA is concerned, is first, what's going to happen as far as suspensions? But second, what are they going to do now to prevent this from happening again? Because I think if you realistically look at things, this has been building to this point for a long time. There's no doubt about it. And again, the NBA being the one sport where fans can actually reach out and touch you now, I, you are going to see, I believe, and you have to, that eliminated. And again, that's talking about the kids who come to the games. You're not going to have access to the players, I don't think, at least for some time. And again, suspensions are going to come for all players involved, which is a part of what should happen. But also, I think fans are going to have to pay some price as well. And you know, you think about it, we almost had the same situation last year. Remember with Antoine Walker up in Boston? Austin. Somebody threw something at him and a fan physically touched him by the bench. It makes you think, is the league going to have to start looking at these arenas and saying, we need to get these first row of seats back removed further from the court so that things like this can't happen. As a player, you can never feel threatened when you're near the court. No player should have to endure that and certainly shouldn't have to endure any sort of provocation from something getting thrown at you or getting physically touched. That makes you feel threatened. You're going to react. You're going to protect yourself. One of the great ironies of this entire thing is that it surrounds Ron Artest, and it surrounds Ron Artest trying to do the right thing, to stay out of a fight, just lounging on the scores table, put on the radio headsets, was talking on the radio and such, trying to do the right thing, yet he just seems to be a lightning rod for these types well, of things. Well, again, maybe he is, and maybe he was in this situation, but at the end of the day, it's going to be real interesting to see what the league does. I can't emphasize this enough. You have security that's assigned by the NBA to every single arena in the league. If you suspend and really harshly reprimand those players, what are you trying to say? If I'm the Players Association, that's an automatic grievance, uh, grievance I'm filing on behalf of those players. And at the end of the day, if you want to discipline those players in the future, you have to make sure you provide adequate security so these kinds of incidents don't escalate to the astronomical proportions that it did tonight. That is the bottom line. Yeah, th there are going to be suspensions for the players. There's no question about it. You, we've talked about Steven Jackson. We talked about Ron Artest. Ben
Ben Wallace. Uh, there possibly could be other players that will be suspended, and rightfully so, because we're not justifying their actions. But again, when you're provoked in the heat of the moment, there has to be some ramifications placed upon the fans in the league. Now, as you said, Stephen, they have to bring into, I think, uh, play different security measures that will try and eliminate this from happening in the future. I think what you're going to see right here, if you had to sit there, go out on a limb and say, look, at it, what about numbers, numbers of games? Well, Ben Wallace, certainly, I think, minimum of two games for, for the initial shove to Ron Artest's face. I think that, that's a minimum. Now you start looking at the Pacers players going into the stands, it's really unprecedented. So how, how do you know how to react to this? But you're looking at somewhere probably from Ron Artest up to 10 games. I think for Steven Jackson probably falls in that category. Jermaine O'Neal probably falls in that category. You know, although he might not have thrown a punch until fans were actually on the court, which I think is a totally different situation. The guys are up to the stands. There's going to be a number of games. It's going to be hard for the league to sort all this out. I agree with you absolutely. For the fans who came on the court, you deserve what you got. And the players should get a pass for that. A little bit later on, we'll have our final thoughts about this unbelievable story from Detroit. Steve, back to you. John, thank you. Unfortunately, we've seen this before in varying degrees. In fact, September 13th of this year, Rangers reliever Frank Francisco hurled a chair into the stands in Oakland and hit that woman in the nose. March 29th, 2001, Ty Domi in the water bottle, squirts a fan, fan falls into the penalty box. Years later, Domi actually settled the case by flying the fan to see a hockey game. May 16th, 2000, several Dodgers followed catcher Chad Kruder into the stands at Wrigley after Kruder went into the stands to retrieve a stolen hat. Somebody swiped it right off his head. April 14th of 92, Rob Ray punching a 21-year-old on the ice in Quebec City after the man jumped onto the ice and challenged the entire Buffalo Sabres bench. And December 23rd, 1979, several Boston Bruins, Peter McNabb, Mike Milbury, Terry O'Reilly, battling Rangers fans up and over the glass at Madison Square Garden. Milbury actually pummeling a fan with his own shoe. More on Friday night's incident at the Palace at Auburn Hills coming up later on Sports Center. Jim Gray with Auburn Hills Police will hear from the authorities. That coming up a little later on this program. Thankfully, there are other sporting events to tell you about. Shaq has found a replacement for Kobe in Miami. Why Dwayne Wade's heroics may be just what the big man needs to make a title run. A little overtime to show you. And the nation's top teams kicked off their season. Things did not go as planned. The third-ranked heels had their hands full. Would a Goliath go down? It's Green Apple Gone Silver. Introducing Bacardi Silver Low Carb Green Apple Premium Malt Beverage. 4.5 grams of carbs and 94 calories never tasted so good. Bacardi Silver. Flavoring your night. Capital One Mascot True Love Challenge. Nothing like a day in the sun to see if Melissa's love for one of these mascots heats up. So who wants to put lotion on my back? Help Melissa choose by voting at CapitalOneBowl.com for the National Mascot of the Year. Tune in to the Capital One Bowl to see who wins. What's in your wallet? <laughs> New Pepsi Holiday Spice is now on its way. Whoops. Let's back her up, boy. <laughs> A blend of cola and spice. It'll be here just for the holidays. Oh, the other way. If it gets here at all. I'll reach over and click up that toggle. The only place in the world. Where I can have a day where everything goes my way. All I want to do is race, Daddy. It's like you. Winner ain't the guy with the fastest car or something. Just the one who refuses to lose. The winner, Mr. Dale Earnhardt. I've lived at least half my life. I've been asleep or something for 42 years. I'm awake now. Nothing empties a psychiatrist's office faster than a suicide. Don't you worry. We'll be just fine. Can I tell you what's on my mind? So you are a good person. Thank you. Hank Azaria is hot. Sundays at 10, 9 Central, only on Showtime. Part of Showtime Unlimited. Add it for $12 or less per month. Call 1-800-DIRECTV to order now. Direct TV HD. Leading the HD revolution with the launches of NBC HD and Bravo HD. Order now and get six months free. Direct TV HD. This is the picture.
Now on pay-per-view, some girls are nice. Regina seems sweet. Some girls are naughty, and some are downright mean. You like Aaron Samuels. I could talk to him for you if you want. <gasps> mean Girls, rated PG-13. Order it now on pay-per-view. Number three, North Carolina in Oakland facing Santa Clara in the Pete Newell Challenge. That's Tar Heel Raymond Felton serving a one-game suspension. He played in a non-certified summer league game. Maybe the SI Jinx. Tar Heels on the cover this week. Second half, Santa Clara's Kyle Bailey knocks down a three. Broncos up eight, and uh oh we could have a Jinx scenario here. Santa Clara up 12. Bailey another three. 20 for Kyle Bailey. It's a 15-point Tar Heel deficit. There's that Jinx again. Bailey, no. Gerard Perkins, the put back two of his 11. Santa Clara's up, and that jinx is starting to become a reality. Time running down. Travis Neeser reverse layup at a career high 26. And the SI cover jinx strikes again. North Carolina on the cover this week. They lose only their fifth opener since 1930. 77 66 against Santa Clara. Another fight in the NBA, the good kind, though. Jazz and Heat were in a fight to win a basketball game. It ends an overtime thriller. Miami down three in the fourth. Dwayne Wade, the feed the Shaq. Cuts the baseline and gets the feed and hits the reverse. Shaq at six assists. Wade pulls up, but Andre Kurilenko called for the foul in the final seconds. Kurilenko can't believe it. Watch it again. Looks like he gets a piece of Wade's hand. Wade hit both freebies. We're going to overtime. In overtime, the heat up one. Wade, the dribble, lobbed to Shaq. Shaq, 22 and 11, put the heat up three. Four-point Miami lead. Carlos Arroyo, the drive, draws the foul. Arroyo made both freebies. Shaq would foul out. So with Shaq out, what are you going to do? Utah would go inside, of course. Carlos Boozer backs down Michael Doliak. Boozer at 25. 15 seconds left. Wade, the drive, and connects. Put Miami up two. Here we go, Jazz next possession. Arroyo leans in and the foul. Arroyo made both free throws, tied it at 105. Arroyo at 18 points. As a team, Utah hit 44 of 52 from the line. Miami, another chance. Wade has the ball. And the game is in his hands. He puts it up. It is good! He did it! Dwayne Wade has won the game! Got the home roll, that bucket gave Wade 39 a new career high, and Miami wins a thriller in overtime. Another good one, Lakers and Suns in Phoenix, under two minutes to go. Kobe Bryant finding Brian Cook, and he's open for three. Lakers up one, Kobe at a triple-double, 29 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists. Final minute, Steve Nash feeds Amari Stoudemire. Amari scored 33, his third consecutive 30-plus game. Nash had 18 points, 16 assists. Suns beat the Lakers 107-102. More from an ugly night in Detroit coming up. Jim Gray speaks with police, and we rejoin the shoot-around cast after a night we won't soon forget. And after 342 victories and 20 bowl wins, why Joe Paterno may be coaching his last game of his 39-year career at Happy Valley Saturday. Tiger, Annika, the Maryland Skins game next weekend on ABC. Cold hard fact. Other beers are heat pasteurized at 140 degrees. Coors Light is always frost brewed at an icy 34. Why? Because we know you love cold beer. Coors Light, our goal, the coldest tasting beer in the world. How do you share it? Shining stuff for you to see. The G35. With the most powerful V6 in its class and a sport tune suspension. The feeling stays with you. The G35 from Infinity. I'm sorry, man. No. You may think this is the saddest thing you've ever seen. I mean, this is Carmelo Anthony, superstar athlete. This hotel room should be a mess. 
chicks and ladies and all kinds of unmentionables. Yet, I don't see. What is this, milk? Who taught him how to be famous? Duncan, man, Duncan! and the gang recap the NFL weekend and get you ready for Monday Night Football on Monday Night Countdown, delivered by UPS, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Recapping the Pacers and Pistons Friday night at the Palace of Auburn Hills. It all started when Detroit's Ben Wallace went in for a layup, fouled hard by Ron Artest from behind, and escalated when Artest stormed into the stands after being hit by a full cup. Just when it appeared tempers had died down Artest, was struck by a cup and beverage thrown from the stand. You know, he jumped up, charged into the stands. This after he was sort of relaxing on the scorer's table there. Artest and Steven Jackson went into the stands after fans. Fans were punching back. This in the final minute of the game. The brawl forced an early end of the Pacers 97-82 when officials stopped the game with 45.9 seconds left. After pushing and shoving between the teams spilled into the stands once fans got involved by throwing things at the players near their scoring table. As you can see, that fan right behind Ron Artest punching away. Another fan right here. Sucker punching Fred Jones from behind. A night we won't soon forget at the Palace of Auburn Hills. Then Ron Artest confronts a fan right onto the court. Players in the stands, fans on the court. It was raining bottles, popcorn. That fan right there about to get hit by Jermaine O'Neal. So O'Neal comes in, seeing the mm. altercation between his teammate Artest and the other fan in the hat there standing up. And then this. The action centered right there in front of our ESPN camera, and someone throws a chair right into the middle of the melee. Security officials doing everything they could to get everybody off the floor safely, but even on the way into the locker room, there was no place to hide from the fans throwing everything down onto the court at Auburn Hills. Our Jim Gray was courtside for the Pacers and Pistons game, covering the game for ESPN, and joins us now from Auburn Hills. Jim. Steve, it was just a very, very ugly scene here at the Palace of Auburn Hills after the Pacers had basically won this game when everything erupted, and I was standing right next to Ron Artest, and now it's uh, taken several hours to unravel and for the facts to begin. The pieces to be put together, and the police are doing that. In fact, right now, police and investigators are in our ESPN trucks reviewing the tapes. Right now, we have the deputy chief of police of Auburn Hills, James Meinberg, here. Uh, James, first of all, how many people were injured tonight, and how many were taken to the hospital? Uh, just one person was taken to a, the hospital. We've had uh, reports of about a half dozen injuries of different types. No injuries were serious or anything. What is the next step now, and, and will fans be prosecuted for their behavior as well as players if you see something on these tapes? Of course, the uh, tapes, uh, we're going over and collecting the videotapes and that. Uh, taking written statements, also talking to people who suffered injuries and were victims and that. All of that will be gathered together, put together, and presented to the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. So once the prosecutor is able to review um, the information we have in the videotapes and that, they'll decide they'll uh, if they want to issue warrants they'll put those out in that we'll also we've already been in touch with the Indiana Pacer organization we'll also give an opportunity for uh, the players to make their statements let me ask you just as, as a as a officer of the law if someone attacks you or throws something at you be it a chair or a bottle uh, is is it then self-defense what is it considered what is an appropriate response the law does allow a person to defend themselves if they feel they're being attacked. Um, circumstances of uh, having a chair thrown at you, definitely, uh, if you feel you need to protect yourself, uh, you can take action in that. That's, that's a judgment call for the prosecutor to make. Was there enough security here tonight? Did security have control of this crowd? Uh, we have excellent, excellent events here at the Palace. Uh, our, our basketball games are some of the easiest events there are. So this isn't this isn't a usual, a uh, very very unusual thing. I worked the very first Palace event, so I, I've been through a lot of this, and this is extremely. We just finished a completely peaceful NBA Finals compared to what most people experience. How would you then categorize or portray this crowd here this evening? Was this unruly? 
uh, I really only observed it over the television and that. And uh, I, I think sometimes the crowd goes differently. And if you watched it on TV, it did look like uh, the game had some intensity to it at the end there. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, James. OK. Deputy Chief of Police here in Auburn Hills. Steve? Jim, did you speak with Ron Artest after the incident? Yes, I did. Uh, I had a brief moment with him uh, as he was walking out of the locker room. He was very calm. Uh, he put his arm around me. And he said he was fine, that he wasn't injured in the brawl. Uh, he said he really couldn't talk much about it. He had uh, wanted to reserve any comments on it right now other than to say he would talk to me later about it and that it was entirely self-defense. And he felt that he had to defend himself. And then he was uh, ushered away and taken on the bus. And then the authorities did allow the bus to leave uh, Auburn Hills and then their plane to go back to Indiana. All right, ESPN's Jim Gray in the middle of a very eventful night at the Palace in Auburn Hills. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And again, to repeat, an NBA official said immediately after the game was canceled, we reserve comments until we review everything in its entirety. The next scheduled meeting between the Pacers and Pistons is on Christmas Day. That game is scheduled for Indianapolis. You can see it right here on ESPN beginning at 1230 Eastern Time. Their next meeting in Detroit, by the way, is set for March 25th. Still ahead, our shoot-around crew returns with some final thoughts following a horrific night at the Palace at Auburn Hills. More on the brawl in Detroit coming up later on SportsCenter. Also still to come, what has Pete Diddy done in Dallas? Got a hold of the Mavs unis, added his own style. Sort of a throwback meets the future. So would it help against the Knicks? Ouch. Finding good investments. Janice goes off the beaten path to hunt for healthy companies the market might have missed. Scopes out the big picture. Drills into the details. Checks for steady growth. Taking a disciplined approach to look for solid ground. Janice picks stocks they think could go places by researching companies from the bottom up. Aiming high to perform for Janice investors. Get there. It's chilly out there, so prepare. Prepare like never before for the kind of chili that rattles your bones and shakes you to your core. The forecast is chilly. Bring it on. That's what the true fans say. A goosebump raising chili that gets inside you and steals your breath away. Introducing Campbell's Chunky Chili. The nation's number one football program sorts out the BCS puzzle. Utah's going to run the table, and they deserve to be in the BCS. ESPN College Game Day goes to Salt Lake to see if the undefeated youths can crash the BCS party. Should they be in? Should they not be in? I think this adds fuel to the fire of Utah. And we'll dissect the even bigger BCS dilemma, who's number two? College Game Day, built by the Home Depot, today at 1030 on ESPN. She has a secret. He has a secret. They all have a secret. Now we're blowing the lid off the best body shaping, calorie burning secret weapon in America with the million selling Gazelle and this once in a lifetime special offer. You can burn total body calories, tone total body muscle with virtually no impact. Last year, Tony Little made TV history by offering the Gazelle's 1495 30 day test drive. Call now and for just $14.95, test drive the Gazelle in your own home, not for 30 days, but for a full 60 days. But wait, this deal just got even better. Take advantage of this TV offer and shipping is free. Save almost $35 and get the Gazelle risk-free in your home for a full 60 days. Call now and your Elite will come with this Power Pistons Resistance Package that adjusts easily for beginners, intermediate, and advanced. Over a million happy customers can't be wrong. Once you try the Gazelle, you'll be just as crazy about it as they are. Don't miss out. Discover the secret to getting in shape with the Gazelle Elite. Call and get yours right now. Sonics looking to make it a nine-game winning streak in Toronto. Trade rumors surrounding Vince Carter, as usual. Second quarter. Great for Alston. Nice pass to Vince for the jam. Carter at 21. Raptors had a five-point lead at the break. Second half, red-hot Sonics. Ray Allen, he was three of six from three land. He had 24. Richard Lewis, four of four from three land. He had 27. And Antonio Daniels, 
playing beat the shot clock with the jumper. Daniels at 19. Sonics win their ninth straight. Raptors have lost five straight after their 4-1 and one start. Knicks and Dallas finishing up their trip to the Texas Triangle. What the heck is that? Mavs wearing their alternate jerseys designed by P. Diddy. Tim Henning of the Mavs said, nobody out there is as quick as Puff and Sean John. I guess that's the name of his clothing line. That's what I understand. <laughs> People are wearing uniforms as fashion. Who's the guy on top in urban fashion? That's P. Diddy, of oh, course. It goes without saying. <laughs> Jerry Stackhouse, baseline drive. I'm gonna run out and get me one. Next chance to tie or take the lead under 10 seconds left. Swing it around for Tim Thomas. No, but the Knicks get the ball back. 1.1 seconds left. Jamal Crawford, the desperation three for the win. No, the Mavs win must be the unis. Well, after missing on the ping pong balls in the lottery, the Celtics have still never beaten Tim Duncan as Spurs to the fleet, looking for their 14th straight win uh, over Boston. We flash back 97 NBA lottery. Celtics had, well, they're the worst team in the league. They expected to get Duncan. They didn't. They end up drafting third, and Rick Pitino's regime in Boston was over before it could even begin. He used ML cars as a good luck charm. Didn't work. Spurs got the top pick, and they've won two titles with Timmy since. Duncan. 8 of 13 from the floor. Celtics open a gap, though. Mark Blount, instead of Duncan, they go with Mark Blount. You know, you do what you can. Gets this one to go around to Starovich and Duncan. Boston would lead by as many as 13 late third. Gary Payton finds Paul Pierce. Pierce knocks it down. He had 25. But the Spurs open the fourth with a 25-6 around Duncan. Back door for Manu Ginobili. He had 26. Tim Duncan now 14-0 all time against the Celtics. After a heated exchange late in Tuesday's Penn State football practice, Joe Paterno, a month shy of his 78th birthday, put on a helmet and struck a confrontational pose in the face of the player who initiated the fight and said, OK, let's go. Now, he was just having some fun and yet another season that's been lacking in that area. Now, maybe for the first time publicly, Joe Pa has revealed part of his exit strategy. Told USA Today, when he does go, he wants to be replaced by someone in-house. That's his word, some of his other words. Wednesday, at the State College Quarterback Club, Paterno said, in a lot of ways, this has been one of the greatest years I've ever been around Penn State. You put up with my alibis and excuses and my feeble answers to some tough questions which I don't really want to answer. I can only say from my heart, it's been a privilege. Sure sounds like a man on the way out. Still to come, the ripples from this giant splash will be felt for quite a while. The players, the league, even the fans, still not sure why it all came to this. More and the fallout from Detroit after this. Can inspiration change your mood? Can luxury feel intimate and stylish? Yes. Can a 340 horsepower Hemi make it move like this, drive like this, cost less than you'd expect, and still turn heads easily? The totally new Chrysler 300, starting at 23,920. Chrysler, inspiration comes standard. This holiday, how will you give her as much joy as she has given you? Ooh, Mom likes it. <laughs> Diamond solitaire earrings from K Jewelers would be a great start. Wow, she really likes it. And you can be assured of two things. Every diamond is hand-selected to match beautifully, and she'll absolutely love them. I think they're gonna kiss now. I think you're right. <gasps> Every kiss begins with K. Cold hard fact. Other beers are heat pasteurized at 140 degrees. Coors Light is always frost brewed at an icy 34. Why? Because we know you love cold beer. Coors Light. Our goal, the coldest tasting beer in the world.
Coaches versus Cancer final at MSG. Number 23, Memphis, sixth ranked Syracuse, first half. Rodney Carney, he just pauses in midair, throws it up. Another look, Rodney Carney literally hanging in the air. Dick Vitale, your thoughts. Remember the name, people, Rodney Carney. It's Carney, capital C A R N E Y. <laughs> Carney, C A R N E Y. Well, he had 25. Second half, Syracuse closes with a 26 and 11 run. Hakeem Warwick had 25. He was MVP. Orange are 4 0. First ever meeting between top ranked Kansas and Vermont. Jaywalk, Jayhawks won 31 straight home openers. The game was tied at 54 at the half. What is going on? T.J. Sorrentine picks up the loose ball and throws a wild one. And at the other end, Taylor Coppenrath lays it in. Vermont had a two-point lead. Coppenrath gets it on the inbounds and lays it in. Vermont by four. Coppenrath at 23. Is Kansas really going to lose? Well, wait a second. Wayne Simeon, the put-away dunk. Simeon at 25. J.R. Giddens, the three. Kansas up one. Now Kansas up two, Aaron Miles, the big jumper. That's the first shot Miles made all night. Top-ranked Kansas survives a scare from Vermont. Players fighting with fans in the stands, fans fighting with players on the court. Up next, the shoot-around crew with some commentary on this sad commentary. Hey, you big Elton John fan? Yeah. Well, then here's your dream ticket. You only find it at Best Buy. Dream Ticket is Elton John's spectacular four-disc, four-destination concert DVD. Featuring radiant performances from around the world. Elton John's Dream Ticket can only be found at Best Buy. Thousands of possibilities. Get yours. It's low carb to the core. Introducing Bacardi Silver Low Carb Green Apple Premium Malt Beverage. 4.5 grams of carbs and 94 calories never tasted so good. Bacardi Silver. Flavor your night. Cable has revolutionized the way you watch TV. Chocolate can hardly say the same. Chocolate equals acne. Cable equals entertainment. All chocolate can do to make things interesting is throw in some nuts or raisins, maybe a bit of nougat or caramel. But try using that chocolate bar to order movies on demand or watch local sports in high def. Nougat can't help you there. Cable chocolate. <laughs> cable chocolate. Find out all the ways the cable is better at onlycablecan.com. This is the coolest thing. I just got a direct TV DVR with you. This is a sports fan's dream. I'm watching the game. A slam dunk to the rafters. Instant replay button. You gotta see it again. I'm the referee. So boom. See that nice linebacker get on that wide receiver. You can see it over and over again. Instant replay. Live television. Hello? The wish list is one of the best things. It's like a search engine. You put in their names, Chicago Bears, New England Patriots. It'll find it. every game for the whole season. One button doesn't get any better than that. Direct TV DVR. Call 1-866-GET-A-DVR for this special offer. Sports TV brings you more women's sports than any other network and has teamed up with the Women's Sports Foundation to support opportunities for new sport programs for young women across the country. Log on to collegesports.com and click on I Support Women's Sports to make your donation. Yeah, that's what little girls are made of. Friday night will be remembered as one of the worst nights in NBA history. The Palace in Auburn Hills, the scene of one of the ugliest NBA brawls. The game was stopped short in the final 45-plus seconds. The Pacers won the basketball game, 97-82. Larry Brown called it the ugliest thing, thing I've ever seen. Rick Carlisle said, I felt like I was fighting for my life. As for what the shoot-around guys thought, here they are. 
Steve, it's been called embarrassing. It's been called ridiculous. We've thrown out the word cowardice. I use the word punk to describe some of the fans. But one thing is for certain, it's historic. This is going to change the climate of the NBA. I it think. absolutely will. And I think, you know, my final thought on all this is it's a shame from this standpoint. So far this, to this point in the NBA season, we have seen great basketball. The league, is everybody is playing well. Scoring is up. You're seeing a lot of great things that happen take place every single night in the NBA. And this is going to detract from it right now. And rivalries are good for the league. The Pistons Pacers right now obviously have the ultimate rivalry. That's good. But when it escalates to this point, it's just ugly. It's bad for the league, and it's a shame because at this point, the NBA has really had a great year. Well, you know, for me, I think we've seen this happen in Europe to a certain extent in terms of uh, a little bit too much involvement from a fan's perspective. I think now what you're going to see is a culture of sport change in America because of this altercation. It's an unfortunate incident, too, because there are a lot of young people out there who still revere athletes and, and appreciate what sport teaches us. It's unfortunate that, uh, that sport in general, I think, is going to be scarred from this, this situation. My final thought is expressed directly and specifically a commission to David Stern. You consistently talk about how this is one of the greatest leagues, if not the greatest sports league in the world. You talk about how exemplary most of the players in this league are. Remember that when you're handing out these fines. We're talking about somebody like a Benny Wallace, who's an exemplary citizen, a fine man. He epitomizes everything that's right about the NBA. Yeah, Ron Artest and Steven Jackson and all of those guys got involved in the fray as well. But remember that when you're handing down these fines, because there's going to be fans out there that's going to look at this and try to find any excuse necessary to blame the players as opposed to themselves. Be sensitive and mindful to that when you're passing judgment and making decisions about these players and their involvement in this whole situation. The Pacers have to play tomorrow. Detroit has the night off. And the next time these two teams hook up, Christmas Day. Steve, back to you. Thank you, John. So how long will the suspensions be? Well, the precedent may have already been set. Back with that after this. Looking for a big league gift for your future pro? The new ESPN Game Station by Fisher Price. It's six sports in one. Basketball, football, baseball, soccer, hockey, golf. The ESPN Game Station, in stores now. Drinks before lunch? Uh, water's fine for me. Uh, water for me too, but with lemon, please. I'll have a Sam Adams, please. Hmm, make that two Sam Adams. Oh, uh, I'll have a Sam also. Me four. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Never miss an opportunity to enjoy a tasty Samuel Adams lager, especially when it's on someone else's tab. Samuel Adams, always a good decision. Introducing Mercury Montego, a dependable ride for the undependable forecast. At work, Fred Parker eats his Snickers to keep going. Packed with peanuts, Snickers handles hunger to keep Fred on the go. Feeling rejuvenated, he calls his wife to tell her he'll be working late, but accidentally dials a radio station. The ninth caller, Fred wins a trip to St. Louis. While visiting the Museum of Natural History, a hanging pteranodon unexpectedly falls. Fred pushes a man out of the way. It's star running back and paleontology buff Marshall Falk. Out of gratitude, the Rams changed their name to the St. Louis Freds. Eat a Snickers and have an NFL team named after you. Make it happen with Snickers. Saturday night, ESPN and ESPN2 have two great college football rivalry games for you. First, 7 Eastern Utah looks to finish the season undefeated. And a 745 Eastern on ESPN, Ron Zook coaches his final regular season game as Florida battles Florida State in prime time. Did you know? Brought to you by Sony and the new Network Walkman player. Sony, like no other. Again, our lead story was the NBA's biggest nightmare. Pistons battling Pacers and Pacers battling Piston fans. Indiana won the game, but really everybody lost. Playing time and money are sure to be lost. That's right. Fines and suspensions. They're still figuring all those out. We can tell you this. Did you know the longest non-drug-related suspension in NBA history served by Latrell Sprewell, then a Golden State Warrior, missed the final 68 games of the 97-98 season. After choking his coach, P.J. Carlissimo, it cost him some $6.4 million. 
in lost salary. That's it for us. I'm Steve Berthini. I'm Steve Levy. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great weekend. See you. Fans are getting involved. Steven Jackson's in the fans.